This show is brought to you by MaximusMark.com. Hey folks, it's Maximus Mark, and welcome to the show that punches you in the face with information, but in a good way. It's Maximus Radio. Today I have a recovering corporate lawyer and co-founder of the successful software company to talk about that oh-so-sweet poison, sugar. He asked one simple question, why is this generation getting so damn fat? His findings and research culminated in authoring a book, Sweet Poison, Why Sugar Makes Us Fat. He has been on a current affair, the Today Show, and talking about sugar. And today I have him on Maximus Radio, the No BS Nutrition and Fitness Show. So it's with pleasure that I welcome David Gillespie to the show. So welcome, David. G'day, Mark. G'day. So can you tell me about your, uh, how you came about to tell this story about sugar? Uh, well, I, I spent most of my life getting fat. Um, you know, it wasn't, I didn't wake up one morning suddenly 40 kilos overweight. It was, you know, probably a kilo here and a kilo there. It got fatter and fatter over time. Um, and, you know, I, I tried everything. I, you know, I would, I would hear about a diet on the radio or something and, and I would try it out. And, and most of them worked, um, you know, for the week or two that I was prepared to stay on them. Um, but usually the willpower gave out and, and uh, I was right back where I was. The weight came back, um, usually with a bit of interest. Um, but uh, so I decided that what I needed to do was find out why what I was being told, which is that you should eat less fat and you know do a bit more exercise, uh, why that wasn't working for me. And and I obviously was misunderstanding something about the evidence. So I decided to um, apply the only relevant training I had, which was to look for the evidence. Um, and go looking for the reason. And, and what I found was that there just wasn't any scientific basis to much of what we were being told about how our bodies worked and what was the best way to ensure that we lost weight. Um, and uh, what I did find, though, was some very interesting information about sugar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely agree with that. So have you just had another question. Have you stumbled across the workings of um, Gary Tabs? Uh, Gary, absolutely. In fact, I, I met Gary um, when he was out in Australia last year in November and we had a good chat. Um, so I, I agree with much of what Gary um, concluded from his research. So he came to a similar conclusion about that the whole fat makes us fat message is wrong um, and that there is, there's really no substance to the whole calories in, calories out uh, type hypothesis. Um, I focused a little bit more, Gary is against carbohydrates in general, whereas I focused a little bit more on the question of fructose. And I thought that Gary um, just recently has put in an article in the New York Times where, where he's uh, focusing also on the issue of fructose. So that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. So um, in your own words, why, why does sugar make us fat? Okay, so it, the first of all, we should be clear about what we're talking about when we say sugar. Um, table sugar, the, the stuff everyone thinks of when they think of sugar, is a combination of two simple sugars, glucose and fructose. Now, the glucose half of sugar is fuel. It's absolutely necessary for us. Um, our bodies run on it. It's, it's, it's desperately required. It can be metabolized by every cell in our body. Um, the fructose half of sugar, however, is a very, very unusual carbohydrate. Unlike every other carbohydrate, it is never converted to glucose unless we are in an energy-starved state. Um, so for the most of us, most of the time, it is never converted to glucose. It is never used for energy. It is converted immediately to fat by our liver, um, which makes it a very unusual carbohydrate altogether. So when we eat sugar, the fructose half of it is converted immediately to fat in priority to everything else that the body does. Um, so by the time we finish a glass of apple juice, the first mouthful is already circulating in our arteries as, as fat. Definitely. Now, besides directly making us fat, it also has a much more insidious effect, which is that that circulating fat affects our ability to recognise when we've had enough to eat. We become insulin and leptin resistant, and both of those hormones tell us, one of the functions they have is to tell us when we've had enough to eat. Um, eating fructose messes with those hormones so that our bodies are given permission to meet, eat more of everything else, not just fructose. So it directly makes us fat and it also gives our bodies to eat more than we otherwise could and that also makes us fat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. One thing that I, I, I do just want to uh, touch on is um, obviously the, the, you know, 
working and living in the fitness industry, you know, when you tell people, you know, fructose uh, does absolutely cause them to put on the weight, the first thing that people say is, doesn't doesn't fruit contain fructose and therefore it's natural? So, you know, what, what's wrong with, can we still have fruit? What's your take on, um, on fruit? Um, there are... There is the, the fructose from five large apples in a small glass of apple juice. Most people can drink a glass of apple juice and eat a meal. Most people cannot eat four or five large apples and still eat a meal. And that alone should tell you the difference between fruit and the, and the sugar from the fruit. Yes, fructose is in fruit, but if you eat it in its original packaging, that is, as a whole piece of fruit, you get all of the fibre, all of the bulk, all of the water, that, that was originally bound up with that sugar. As long as you eat your fruit that way and you don't eat more than, say, two pieces of it a day, you are not going to have too much fructose. It's when you concentrate the fructose from fruit by making juice or by drying it um, that then you are likely to overload on fructose from fruit. Absolutely, definitely. Um, yeah, they say that you know, in nature, the nature made the poison with the antidote, and the fact that when we eat fruit, we also get the fibre that's contained with the fruit. That's right. And the juice is nature's way of making us get to the fibre. Yeah. So very good. Well, absolutely. I mean, yeah. uh, I guess from a tree's perspective, um, putting fructose in fruit was a really excellent way to get animals to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the only trouble is that the the processed food industry has copied that exact same strategy and now puts it in everything. Yeah. And for exactly the same reason, to get animals, i.e. us, to eat it. So one thing, another thing I want to touch on, I'm not sure if you've heard of um, a condition called uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, yes. where, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you talk about that? I was, uh, I'm fascinated by that and how that's actually happening. And I, you know, okay. Yeah, you, you can take it away. So, so fatty liver disease um, is starting to be a significant problem uh, in the population. Because there are no obvious symptoms of the disease until you are in a quite advanced state, it's estimated that around 25 to 35% of the population are currently suffering from it. And what it is, is an accumulation of fat around the liver. Now, not too long ago, pretty much the only reason why someone would have this disease is that they're alcoholic. Um, but what has happened now is that the non-alcoholic version of fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, the one you referred to, is now very much more dominant than any of the alcoholic form ever was. Uh, the reason for that is that when we consume fructose, remember that I said it was converted to fat? Well, that fat accumulates around the liver. And that is why we are seeing a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease grow so quickly. Uh, it is now... Um, probably the most dominant form of early onset indication that people are consuming too much sugar. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I, I, I did hear, um, I always forget his name, Robert Lintz Glask, I can't pronounce his name. He, um, he has a clip on YouTube called The Bitter Truth, Sugar. Um, and yeah. it's, it's a fantastic, and he talks about how fructose, uh, you know, well, alcohol, is 10% percent metabolized in the brain. That's why we get drunk. The other 90% is metabolized in the liver. And that's why it takes years um, for, the, for the liver to actually get fat um, from the alcohol. Whereas fructose, 100% of that is, is basically digested in the liver um, and it all converted to fat basically if unused. Um, yeah, yeah so. Rob, Rob Lustig is a um, pediatric endocrinologist in the United States who has uh, um, been campaigning against fructose for many years. And and there is a lecture that he's given, uh, which is on YouTube, called The Bitter Truth. Um, and it is a, a compelling viewing. It's about an hour and a half long, but it's well worth watching. Yeah. Um, and well over a million people have watched it now. And it, and it really does give a comprehensive summary of why fructose is bad for us. Not just because it makes us fat or it gives us alcoholic liver disease, but also because it gives us type 2 diabetes, heart disease, encourages cancer growth. Uh, encourages Alzheimer's uh, and dementia, depression, anxiety. So th there are a lot of cascading damages done by sugar. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. Do you think food companies are trying to make people addicted to their food through fructose and other additives? I think they know that it is addictive. They know that they will sell more food if it has fructose in it than if it doesn't. Um, and so in that sense, they're trying, they're just trying to do what they're designed to do, which is to sell more food. And so it's a competitive place out there in the real world in the supermarket. And 
they know that if they have more fructose than the guy next to them on the shelves, they'll probably sell more product, and that and that I think is what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So from I guess a physiological point of view, why why is it that we get addicted to the sugar? Um, okay, so sugar itself is not uh, the, the molecule, the fructose molecule can't be addictive. It's sugar, um, but. The, uh, what happens is that fructose, when we consume fructose, we generate a cortisol spike. Now, cortisol is our own built-in opioid, um, and it is an opioid in exactly the same fashion that nicotine is an opioid. Uh, every time we take a hit of fructose, we get a very large cortisol spike, which is why they've been able to observe that fructose depresses the immune system. When you feed someone fructose, their immune system goes to about half capacity for uh, anywhere between two and six hours. Um, and that's the, the effect of the cortisol. One of the things the cortisol does is depress the immune system. Um, that cortisol, is, that cortisol hit, is addictive. You you get a cortisol hit every time you consume fructose. And if you're consuming fructose in everything you eat, you're getting a lot of cortisol hits in a day. So you become addicted to that hit. Yeah. And in exactly the same way that someone is addicted to nicotine, and that's why breaking a sugar habit is exactly the same, the same as breaking a nicotine habit. You have a very definite withdrawal period with very similar symptoms, um, and then once you are over it, you don't desire it at all anymore. So when someone actually literally says, um, you know, I'm trying to get off Coca-Cola or get off, you know, the jam donuts, but uh, I just need one, they, they yes. literally mean that as a... Uh, they literally to... mean it. Yeah. They literally yeah. mean it in exactly the same way that a smoker means that they need the next cigarette. Yeah, because that, from a brain point of view, brain function point of view, it's the same thing's happening. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, for sure. So in your opinion, how, how would one kick the habit? Uh, well, you have to, to follow similar steps to a uh, person quitting smoking. You have to intentionally stop, although it's much more difficult with sugar because, as I said, sugar is embedded in so many foods. But one rule I've found that helps people do that is um, to uh, remember a rule of thumb in shopping in the supermarket. Shop the perimeter of a supermarket. Everything you need to live is on the perimeter of a supermarket. The fruit, the veg, the milk, the, the meat, uh, the bread... Uh, the dairy. It's all uh, around the edge of the supermarket. You don't need anything in the middle. That's processed foods and most of it contains significant quantities of sugar. If there are things in there that you really do want, then you have to be very careful about which ones you buy. So first of all, you have to eliminate the sugar. You have to intentionally stop consuming any sugar at all. And you will have the same effects that someone who gives up smoking has. So you'll have mood swings, you'll have headaches, you'll have cravings. But that will end within about two weeks. Once that ends, you'll find your palate adjusts and you can taste things that you never tasted before and you no longer have the sweet cravings that you would have had your entire life before that. The other thing you notice is you have an appetite control all of a sudden. Your appetite suddenly kicks in. Halfway through a meal that you would have easily finished before, your appetite control kicks in and says, I'm full, and you stop. And that's why it makes you lose weight. So definitely uh, cutting cold turkey. Absolutely. Cold turkey works best. Yeah. Well, it works best for me. Some people say, look, I can't do cold turkey. Um, I, you know, it, 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 I just can't manage that. And what I suggest to those people is stepping it down precisely. So recording exactly where they are getting sugar in a day and then carefully and methodically day by day eliminating a part of that every day so that by the end of two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, they are completely off the sugar. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree with that cold turkey. In my experience, cold turkey is the only way that it works. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's more difficult to yeah. do it the other way, but some yeah. people find it easier to do it the other way. Yeah. Um, can you comment on things like artificial sweeteners? Okay, so most I, I like to call artificial sweeteners um, methadone for sugar addicts. Um, they are something that you can take when you are desperate for that hit during the withdrawal phase, um, and they probably won't do too much damage. Um, by the time you get to the end of a draw, you won't want them anyway. Your taste will have adjusted so much that they will taste like what they are, which is chemicals. Um, mm. uh, but they certainly help during withdrawal. Every time you feel like that heat, you go for it. It won't satisfy the heat. You, you, you'll still want cravings, but at least it will give you something to do with your hands while you're getting through withdrawal. 
Yeah, I, I was watching an interesting documentary. It's called um, E Numbers, uh, the food myth. Um, I forget the guy yeah. who made it, but it's a BBC program, and he was basically showing some brain scans of people who ate the full sugar version and the, the basically the artificial sugar version. And what they showed was the brain centres eating the artificial uh, sweeteners. It, it it didn't trigger the same uh, centre because there's no basically no, no calories. Doesn't. Yeah, so no, people were no. able to eat more on the um, artificial sweetness because they weren't getting that um, that those it, calories. It is, it is a mistake to eat artificial sweeteners and keep eating sugar. Um, yeah. They should should only be used as a substitute while you're trying to get through withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Are you uh, very anti, like, things like, obviously, on the internet, if you type in a Spartan or, you know, sucrose or any of these things? Or not, not particularly. Um, the, the, the evidence against them is not particularly strong. The evidence for them is not particularly strong. I suspect most people who come off sugar will not consume them for very long. I don't think there is likely to be any significant damage for, for consuming an artificial sweetener during a withdrawal period. Yeah. And I honestly don't believe that anyone will want it after withdrawal period because now when I taste an artificial sweetener, having been off sugar, they really do taste like a chemical cocktail and I don't find them pleasant at all. I'd rather just drink water. Absolutely. Totally agree with you there. Um, can you comment on the state of the food supply and the basically food industry? What's your whole uh, perspective of things? Uh, well, I, I think, as I said before, it's a competitive place and the food industry is adding more and more fructose because it is addictive and it sells more product. Uh, and they are not paying for the consequences, which is you know, obesity and a cascade of, of very serious diseases. When a message comes out that they should not be having sugar in their food, they attack it fairly viciously um, because they know that will affect sales. Um, and that's what makes getting this message out there very, very difficult. Yeah. As, as a, um, I guess, an ex-lawyer, um, what, what can, you know, the listeners, myself, you know, people who, what can we do to obviously um, put, slip the power in the favour of, you know, good food? Vote with your feet. Um, don't buy foods that contain sugar. That's, that's the, the only thing they care about is sales, and if you don't buy their products then next Tuesday they'll be making products without sugar in them. Absolutely. Great point. You know, that it come, again, comes back down to the, the mighty dollar. Now, uh, let's, yeah. let's uh, backtrack for just a sec. You, you spoke of some hormones before, like the appetite hormones, leptin and insulin. Can you just explain yeah. um, uh, leptin's role in the body? Sure. So leptin is produced by our fat cells, um, and so it, it's kind of a fuel gauge in our body. It has a, a similar appetite-suppressing effect as insulin, but insulin is short-lived. Insulin responds to consumption. So when we have a meal, insulin spikes, um, and it suppresses our appetite to tell us to stop eating. Um, leptin does the same thing, but on, on a long-term basis. So it, it's released by our fat cells. The more fat cells we have, the more leptin is released, the more our appetite is suppressed. So it's a way of our body knowing how much fuel it has on board and having the appetite controlled by the amount of fuel. If we've got a lot of fuel, a lot of stored fat, we don't need as big an appetite. And that's leptin's role. The trouble with fructose is it suppresses that so that leptin is no longer giving an accurate signal. It's like having a fuel tank on a car which always says you're empty, but when the car still has three quarters of a tank in it, except that this car, when you put another tank full of petrol in, it takes it. So and it's sort of, sort of a giant inflatable bag behind the car, if you like. Mm. Um, so it's that kind of a leptin is our fuel gauge, and fructose breaks it. Excellent. That's a, that's probably the best analogy I've heard uh, to date. Leptin is the fuel gauge of the appetite, uh, basically. That, yeah, that's excellent analogy. Thanks for that. So um, one thing that I, I I've been basically blasting on my my blog and telling all my clients and making YouTube videos of is you know breakfast cereals and I you know I do tell people to avoid yeah. breakfast cereals and you know jump on board the meat and nut breakfast and uh, you know have a, yep. have a good protein fat. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely agree with that. Um, there, there are very, very few breakfast cereals that are worth eating. Um, probably the only one that you could have would be uh, unflavoured oats or wheat, so wheat biscuits or, or unflavoured oats. Um, the rest have significant quantities of sugar in them. Most breakfast cereals sold in Australia are at least one quarter sugar. Uh, there is no good reason to eat a breakfast cereal. Yeah, one, one of the, I guess the most, my pet peeves are, are things like Cocoa Pops and Milo, for example, where they're marketed directly at kids, but, you know, unfortunately yeah. kids are... Yeah, your, 
Yeah, your listeners should remember that in the, in the processed food industry, the word energy is a synonym for sugar. Mm. So when, the, when you see high energy breakfast cereal, say like Nutrigrain or Milo, what they're saying is high sugar breakfast cereal. But there's no such thing as a low sugar breakfast cereal. Even, even the so-called healthy breakfast cereals, things like Just Right and so on, are, you know, are, are a good third sugar. So mm. there, there isn't a breakfast cereal really that you should be eating other than unflavoured oats or wheat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now I just want to uh, delve into something you raised before. Um, you said sugar is an opioid or acts as an opioid. You said about it boosting cortisol and cortisol acts on the brain. Is, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. So was there, is there anything else that we're missing from that equation or is that basically that's the way it works? Well, that's the way the addiction mechanism works, but... Um, there's there's other things that sugar does. So, for example, sugar is the only uh, fructose is the only carbohydrate which causes a, a uric acid spike. Now, uric acid is a waste product. When sugar is converted into fat, a waste product of that process is the production of uric acid. Now, uric acid as a waste product is eliminated from our system by our kidneys. Um, too much uric acid means kidney damage, which is why we are seeing chronic kidney disease growing almost as fast as fatty liver disease. It is now the greatest cause of hospitalisation in Australia today. So um, uric acid is another aspect of, of the cascade of things that, that fructose causes. It really is a very destructive element of our food supply. And the reason it's causing the kind of damage it's causing now in our food supply is that we are consuming truly vast quantities of it in comparison to even 200 years ago. 200 years ago, the average Australian was probably consuming about one kilo of fructose a year. Um, and that was probably the most we'd ever consumed in our entire history. Um, now, the average Australian is probably consuming somewhere between 25 and 30 kilos of fructose a year. So that kind of increase in such a short period of time shows why we are so poorly adapted to those kinds of quantities of a substance which has so many disastrous metabolic effects. Mm. For sure, for sure. Um, what, I guess what's the most shocking thing that uh, you found out or some of the shocking things that you found out about uh, in the research that you've done about sugar? Um, how poorly adapted we are to it in that, you know, we, our, our bodies are designed for a, you know, a homeostatic uh, level. That is, you know, we're self-leveling. We, we eat too much glucose, our appetite is controlled. We, eat, you know, eat too much fat, our appetite is controlled and we eat less next time. You know, we have a very well-maintained system of keeping everything in control and everything in balance. And... The disastrous thing about fructose is it messes with those balances and it messes up our hormonal controls so that we are no longer in balance. The reason we get fat is because of metabolic dysfunction with fructose interfering with the operation of our hormones. Um, and that's the, the really disastrous thing about this molecule. In small quantities in our diet, it's fine, but in the kind of quantities we are now consuming, it is very, very dangerous. Yeah. For sure. So um, I guess what final thoughts could you offer the listener around fructose and, um, you know, basically healthy eating? Um, avoid fructose at all costs and then you can eat whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very simple way to put it. So um, let me ask you, how can uh, my listeners find out more about you? Uh, we'll just go to my website, which is at sweetpoison.com.au. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to thank you uh, so much for coming on the show today, David. Um, as as, as you said, for more information, it's uh, www.sweetpoison.com.au. Grab a copy of his book today, Sweet Poison, Why Sugar Makes Us Fat. Thanks again. And uh, what's what's on the cards for the future? What what uh, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, I'm working on, a, working on a book at the moment about uh, some of the dangers that seed oils um, uh, cause in, in our food supply. Yeah, so canola um, oil, so is that right? Sorry, what was that? The canola oils, uh, those type yes, of oils? Yes, those yeah. kinds of oils. So they're often called vegetable oils, but believe me, no vegetables were harmed in the making of a seed oil. So I'm talking about uh, canola oils, uh, soy oils, uh, those sorts of things. Well, that sounds terrific. Um, before I let you go, I do need to ask this question. Um, 
I, my understanding of vegetable oils is that they're all trans fats or some some basically close resemblance of a trans fat um, where they're basically either fully hydrogenized or basically partially hydrogenized oils, basically altering the molecules. And because of that fact, they interact with our DNA differently, um, which makes them a very poor food choice. Is that correct or can you comment on that? Well, they're, they're a poor food choice, whether they... Part of the way seed oils are used, so they do create trans fats to make them more solid so that they are more usable in things like margarines. But that's not the real danger in the seed oils. Yes, that is dangerous, but the real danger is the particular fats that are, that are present in seed oils are very poorly dealt with by our body. And yes, they do cause DNA damage and they are likely to be implicated heavily in the development of cancer. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like we're going to have to have another show when, um, when that book gets released. Yeah. Absolutely. No worries, David. Well, thanks again, and best of luck with the book. Thank you. Pleasure to talk to you, Mark. Likewise. Bye. Bye-bye. This interview was brought to you by www.maximusmark.com. There it is, guys, my interview with David Gillespie. He's the author of Sweet Poison. Go out and grab his book today. Fantastic read. What I will say, the the whole reason for me putting these shows together is that you guys, the listeners, go out and share. Number one, share these interviews. And number two, act on these interviews. Let me address the first one. Why do I want you to share these? Well, as David alluded to and many of my other guests alluded to, the only way we're going to change a corporate food structure is to vote with our dollars. So we need a lot of people. So the real catalyst for me doing the show is, you know, call it a cause if you will, but I, I really want to change things in Australia of how the food industry is done. I want food companies to do the right thing by us, the consumers. So, you know, it's, 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 it's my right to produce this type of information to help you guys make better nutritional choices and, you know, help create a change in supermarkets and uh, things that are happening in, in our country. You know, that's what I'd really love to see. I'd really love to see you act on this information, go out, so, uh, so, seek out a local farm where you can buy your meats, vegetables, all that type of thing from, you know, consume your products from them, buy your products from them, giving back to the local community, probably going to get it even at a cheaper price. And again, you're going to get such much better food and, you know, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I know when I get tomatoes from the supermarket compared to tomatoes from my local organic farmer, it's completely different. You know, the tomatoes taste absolutely delicious from my local farmer. Not only are they cheaper, they taste nicer, but they're also better for me as well. So, I mean, it's it's pretty much a no-brainer. And before I, I kind of wrap up this podcast today, what I, what I do want to say is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a habit. It's no different. If, if you're in the habit, you might be in the habit now of buying foods from the supermarket. What I'm asking you is to change that habit and create a habit of buying things from your local farmer. You know, really act on it. Really just do a little bit of research. Go out, meet your local farmer. You know, my local farmer, I order a quarter of a cow at a time. I actually have some friends who order, you know, part of the cow with me. And, you know, we buy it. He delivers it to my house, you know, great price. It's, it's just terrific, mate. It's fantastic. You know, there's no reason why you can't do that as well. Save some money in the in the process and get some really great produce. As Again, as I said before, give back to the community as well. So that's my message. Number one, act on these things and then share it with, with your friends, hoping they'll act on it too. So, you know, we really can create a change in this country. And if we are going to create that change, it really is up to us. So I hope you enjoyed the interview. Till next time, guys, train hard, eat well and supplement smart.